morning, everybody, and welcome to God's house as we continue our journey through the season of Advent. And for those of you watching uh, on the World Wide Web, we welcome you as well. Would you please stand for the uh, lighting of the third uh, candle of the Advent wreath? We begin this worship service in the name of our strong and living God, in the name of the Father. Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. As we prepare to light the third Advent candle, we recall that the first candle represented the faith God has planted into our hearts. And the second candle reminds us of the freedom we enjoy in Jesus Christ. What is the meaning of the third candle? The third candle reminds us of the joy we have in Jesus Christ. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Burst forth into jubilant song. We light the candles. And let us continue together, please. Father, Father in, in this solemn Advent, Advent moment, moment let, let your flame stir up in us the joy we have in you. May you be the joy of my desire, my all-consuming fire. Help me to love you with all of my heart, my soul, and my strength. Teach me to grow in your ways and to serve you in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness. For you live and reign as one God, even in our world today. Amen. Show us your unfailing love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. I will listen to what God the Lord will say. He promises peace to his people, but let them not return to folly. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Alleluia, alleluia. God sends his messengers to prepare his way into the lives of his people. And together we pray the prayer for the day. Stir up our faith, O Lord, as you did through John the Baptist, the forerunner of Christ, Grant that we may continue to know your salvation and serve you in holiness and righteousness all the days of our lives. May you, the God of peace and joy, sanctify us through and through so our entire spirit, soul, and body may be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The, the one who calls us is faithful, and he will do it. In Jesus' name, amen. Please take time to greet those around you this morning. Good morning, Eduardo. Good morning, Missy. Good morning. Nice to have you here. Try and behave yourself.
All right, have a seat. Nice to have a greeting of peace, isn't it? And uh, by the way, uh, this last Wednesday we had our we had our devotion, and then we had a luncheon. It was nice to have a meal together. Let's sing the song. Turn to page three. We're going to sing "My Life Is in You, Lord." Okay, you guys will lead us. Thank you. Take out your Bibles, if you would, please, and turn to Luke chapter 7. Go ahead, Ben. Luke chapter 7, you will find this on page 1603, and uh, we continue the uh, gospel lessons on Johnny the Baptizer. Anybody remember Johnny the Baptizer? Little short Jewish guy. <laughs> kind of a wild looking character. All right, so this is when uh, John sends his disciples to Jesus to hear if he's the Savior or if he's not the Messiah. I'm going to begin, page 1603, uh, Luke chapter 7. I'm going to start at verse 18, okay? So John's disciples told him about all these things that Jesus had done. So calling two of them, he sent them, that is, John sent them to the Lord to ask, are you the one who was to come, or should we expect someone else? When the men came to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist sent us to you to ask, are you the one who was to come? Or should we expect someone else? At that very time, Jesus cured many who had diseases, sicknesses, and evil spirits. He even gave sight to many who were blind. So he replied to the messengers, you go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight. The lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cured. The deaf hear. The dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. Blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. Would you join me, please? After John's messengers left, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out into the desert to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No. 
Those who wear expensive clothes and indulge in luxury are in palaces. But what did you go out to see? Prophet? Yes. Whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. This is the word of our Lord. Would you please turn to uh, page 1830, and there you will find Philippians chapter 4. Page 1830. Here, we got to go way back here. There you go. There you go, right there. Right there, I think. Okay. Page 1830. So our verses for today come from St. Paul in the letter to the church in Philippi. Anybody know what was going in Paul, on in Paul's life when he wrote this? He was in prison, yeah. We believe he was in prison in Rome, and he was awaiting his trial, which eventually led to his execution, right? He also wrote other letters. He wrote uh, to the church in Colossae, Ephesus, and he wrote to Philemon, um, that short letter. But anyway, interestingly, Paul is in prison. And I'm sure it was not like being at the Ritz. And he's in prison. He probably realizes that he's not going to be set free, but death is imminent. And in this letter, you know what old St. Paul does? Fourteen times he uses the word rejoice or joy. I'm going to tell you, hopefully I'll remember to finish the sermon on this. we got to learn a lot from St. Paul about suffering in the kingdom of God. So we're going to begin with, we're only going to use the first half, and then we're going to end the sermon with the last two verses. So would you join me? Let's not go too quickly, uh, but join me, okay? Verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So keep your Bibles open. Let's go through these these, uh, first verses. First of all, rejoice in the Lord, and then it should be keep on rejoicing. So rejoice. What is it? If you look on the wall over there, you'll see the four words of Advent, hope, love, joy, and peace. Notice what Paul says. He says, rejoice in the Lord. The first thing I want to tell you today is that when the Bible and St. Paul talks about joy and rejoicing, He's not telling us to be happy. There's a huge difference between the happiness of the world and life and the joy that St. Paul talks about. And I often use this in funerals. I don't know if you remember that, but there's a passage, I think, from Thessalonians where he says, be joyful always. And how amazing it is that when we have a funeral memorial service for someone, we can talk about what? Joy. And rejoicing, even with tears in our eyes and sorrows in our hearts. And I often wonder, and I think I usually say this, how do people who have no Lord Jesus Christ in their lives, how do they gather for a memorial service? God's not there. Or a figment of his imagination is there. And their life is empty. You know, Joe's dead. Oh, well, it's too bad, we're sad, we got to go on. No, we can rejoice in the Lord even at funerals. Now, isn't that crazy, people? 
We take that for granted, but we can sing joyful, uplifting songs even at funerals because we rejoice in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the first point of the sermon for today. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ that he came into this world as almighty God the Son. He taught us the will and way of the Father. He gave up his life on the cross to pay for your sins and mine, and he rose victoriously on Easter Sunday. Let me say to you, without the gospel of Jesus Christ, what are we? We're empty, or we're a nice civic organization who get together once in a while. Think about that. What is the Holy Christian Church without the gospel of Jesus Christ? It is empty. We're in just a nice civic organization that gets together to have coffee. Thank, thank you, Ed. Very good. To have coffee and to complain about one another periodically, right? All right? But that's all we are. But with the Lord Jesus Christ, there is this element of joy and thanksgiving, even in the midst of sadness and a broken heart and sorrow. We can have joy in knowing that this life is not the end, and Christ has won us the life in the world to come. So Paul says, keep on rejoicing. And if there's ever a time that your heart and mind should be full of joy, it should be in this Advent Christmas season. And I'm not talking about the joy because the baby Jesus looks so cute in the manger. I'm not talking about because Mary's so pretty, you know, and sitting there and, and she's loving toward the child. It's not the happiness when you look at your house on the outside or inside and you say, isn't it wonderful, all the stuff we've got? Or you look under the tree and see all the Christmas presents. That brings us joy. But the joy that we have is the joy of Christmas. It is the joy not of the stuff of Christmas, but of the child of Christmas and of the God of Christmas. As you and I come to celebrate Christmas again this year, you can have all the other stuff. And by the way, that's what the unbelievers have. Our culture has all the external stuff. We don't even want to mention the name Jesus in the same phrase as Christmas. We don't even want to call it Christmas. The culture wants to call it the winter holidays. You and I as believers, we're different. Our life, our Christmas is centered not in the stuff of the culture, but it is centered in the child of Christmas and in the God of Christmas. And that brings us to verse 5. Look at verse 5. Let your gentleness be evident to all will come to the Lord is near. But let your gentleness. The result of divine joy in your life and mine is what? For us to... No, for us to bring joy into the lives of others. To have the joy of the Lord in my life is for me to bring that joy into those around me, okay? Now, there you have the word gentleness. You see the word gent Let your gentleness. Anybody know another word for this? I'm going to use a word that we don't use in our culture hardly at all. Nope. Anybody? How about the word magnanimous? When's the last time you heard the word magnanimous? Somebody said to me, well, I'm magnanimous. Man, I'm, I'm a pretty good person. No, that's not what we're talking about. Let me give you the definition. I invite you, and don't look at it now on your phone, okay? But I invite you to go home, pull the book off the shelf, and turn to the M's in the dictionary, all right? Magnanimous, powerful word. It's not very popular in our culture. Magnanimous is generosity. It is being benevolent. It is overlooking the faults of 
other people. It is not being resentful or envious. It is not getting my way and what I want. And if I don't get it, I'm going to let you have it. Magnanimous is the opposite of what's going on in our culture today. Magnanimous, again, is generosity. It is benevolence toward others, especially those you don't always like. It is overlooking the faults of others, not being resentful. I don't know where you live or where you drive, but where I drive, magnanimity is not very prevalent. I would say that magnanimity on the roadway, on the street, especially on the 118 and, and DeSoto Avenue, magnanimity is not on the minds of most drivers. Yesterday, I just had another incident where someone on my left decided within two feet of me to pull over in front of me so they could get one car in front of the next person on that side. And the great joy of, and, it took, and I was thinking about being magnanimous during that time. <laughs> but here's the good news. About a mile down the road, guess what? No. I passed him. <laughs> All right? So magnanimous is not part of our culture, okay? I mean, as believers, and here's another point, folks, as the, our joy of Christmas is not of the culture, so our magnanimity is to be different than the culture around us where it's lacking. You and I as believers, we need to bring magnanimity into the picture in our lives, okay? As opposed to the culture, our mouths, our attitudes need to be filled with praise, thanksgiving, kindness, and gentleness to others. And this is opposite the culture of today. Let me just talk about today's culture. It's full of foul language, foul gestures, hatred, and judgment, and quick to condemn. Amen? Amen? That's our culture. You and I, as believers, we need to be countercultural, which means we need to not join the way of the culture and not follow what we see on the highway when someone passes another person. And I want to remind you of that today. So I say to you, don't join the culture. Be magnanimous as a child of God because of the joy of the Lord in your life, okay? And that, and that should and, and give others the right of way. Be courteous at the grocery store. Don't knock over the old lady next to you, okay? <laughs> and, and don't be so easily, here's a good one. Don't be so easily offended. Oh, is that our culture? How about nepotism? No, no, no. Uh, it's all about me. That's not nepotism. Not a, narcissism, thank you. It's all about what I want, okay? Not that, all right? It, and don't be easily offended when you don't get what you want. I'm quick to let you know it, okay? All right, that brings us to part three. Why? The magnanimity, because the joy of the Lord is in my life, now I can bring that gentleness, that magnanimity into the lives of others because the Lord is near. Think about this. The Lord is near. He's, what that means is he's in your vicinity. <laughs> he's close by you. He's in your presence. You and I are under the gaze of Almighty God. He is close to you, he's present with you, and he knows what's going on in your situation. And let me just say, someone, I didn't think of this, but someone said, yeah, he's with there with the big club waiting to hit me. <laughs> no, 
That's not the point. The point is he's next to you. He's near you. He knows what's going on, and he's there to what? Help you and guide you and lead you. And that's why we give it up to verse 6, prayer. Okay? Verse 6, give it up to prayer with thanksgiving. So I want to say to you, the third point of today is have a sense of God's presence in your daily life. The first was rejoice in the Lord. Second was magnanimous, being magnanimous. But now have a sense in your life of God's presence with you. I've been thinking about this since Tuesday or Monday. Am I aware of the presence of God? And you know what I found out? Periodically, I am. But a lot of the time, I'm not. And I got to work on that. Sensing the presence of the Lord brings us, what's the fourth one? The peace of God. And I learned that this week. When I have a sense of the nearness of God, you know what comes over me? No, well, yeah, but a sense of peace and calmness, a sense of peace. Let me read this. The way to be anxious about nothing is to be prayerful about everything. Don't you like that? Let me say it one more time. You can write it down. The way to be anxious about nothing is to be prayerful about everything. And the peace of God comes. Now, if you look at our verse, the peace of God which transcends all understanding, what does that mean? That God's peace, he transcends all the plans we have. You know, you and I have the plans for this and for that, and that's good. But God's plans are mostly better than ours. We can't see the future, but we know the outcome, right? Whatever happens, the joy of the Lord and the peace of God can be in my life because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want to read to you something at the end. All right, it's the peace of God himself. Let me read this. Our gentleness and magnanimity flows from the knowledge God is near, which flows from the peace of God, which comes to us through prayer. See how St. Paul wrote this, everything is connected. Everybody got that? In this. All right, now last, finally. I got a couple of finally. Finally, we believers in the church in America, you know what we need? And I need it too. We need joy. We need a good dose of joy. I don't know if you're aware of what's going on in the Christian church in the United States of America. Anybody here go online and see what's going on? It's tragic, folks. The decline, the diminishing of the church in America is amazing. The devil is probably re rolling his hand saying, I, I'm, I'm winning this one. We need joy even in the midst of suffering and diminished church in America. One of the things we learn from St. Paul, here he is in prison, and he's writing about joy and rejoicing. I want to tell you, folks, as American believers, you and I have a lot to learn about suffering for the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know if there's anyone here who was raised in a culture or in a world that suffered for that. There are a lot of folks who have, and they're in America now. But one of the things we need is a good dose of joy, and we need to learn the reality that we are and probably will suffer for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ in these United States. And we don't need to run and cower. We don't need to be a pain in the neck. We need to be filled with joy, magnanimity, and be countercultural. 
So I invite you this Advent season, think about the joy in your life and how you bring that to others. Now, where'd this come from? Our insurance guy? Yeah. It's interesting how things come together. Maybe you don't know that, but this has been sitting on my desk for four days, I think. And I finally, yesterday morning, decided I would use it. Have you ever taped a sports game because you could not watch it live? Have you ever taped a sports game because you couldn't watch it? Okay, well, if you can imagine that, because you couldn't watch it. And then someone told you the outcome of the game before you could watch it. Anybody have that happen to you? So you taped the game, you didn't watch it, and then your neighbor or your friend says, oh, by the way, did you see the Packers lost? Or one, I should, I'm in trouble now. Oh boy. Before you get a chance, when this happens, you know that your team won. So while you're watching the game, you watch it differently, don't you? You see your team fumbles or misses a big shot or throws an interception or misses the kick, right? But then you say to yourself, well, that's okay. I know they won the game. I know the ending. I know that my team wins. Isn't that where we should be as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ? We deal with problems. We walk around so many times gloomy and depressed. But we know the ending. We will be in the glory of heaven when the game, when all of this is over. And shouldn't that give us joy and peace now? So let's focus on this rather than all the things that are going to distract us. And may hope, may the hope that is that you have this Christmas season fill you with God's joy peace, love, and hope. Now let's read the last two verses together. And notice how this all, Paul, thank you, Paul. Notice how this fits together. Join me. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. You have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me. Put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to continue uh, the service with the offering of our tithes and gifts to the Lord Jesus. And um, then, fellas, we're going to make a change. We're going to continue with the prayers for the day and then sing, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. Okay? Go ahead. So we'll continue. After the offering, we'll continue with the prayers for the day then sing the hymn, and then close with the Benedictus. All right, just wait right here, guys.
please take out your uh, insert and turn to um, Faith and Fellowship, if you would. And let me just share a few things. Uh, first of all, we want to remind you about uh, Donald Los. That is Pastor Bart Los's father. And uh, he's a little older than me, I think. And uh, he's been in the hospital uh, in Pennsylvania. And I'm not sure exactly all the details, but he is a caregiver for his wife. And so we want to pray for that, for him to be able to leave the hospital and return home, okay? Also, uh, we're going to pray for Bill Volkert, Sr. I guess Bill uh, fell at home during the night. You know, Bill's only, well, he's about 90-some years old. I was going to say 190, but 90 years old. And he fell and hurt himself. He was in the ER today, so we hope he's okay. And um, also, uh, Sherry Palmquist, who is the ed, uh, Judy Palmquist's daughter, yeah, daughter-in-law through marriage. Uh, Sherry passed away yesterday um, at the age of 60. And I think, was it COVID-related? It was, I think, I'm not sure. But uh, we want to remember the Palmquist. Ed, if you remember Ed and, Sher and Judy Palmquist. And also, we're going to pray for the people in the Midwest Anybody remember living through tornadoes in the Midwest? I do. Ben, we're in the, we're in the bathroom uh, downstairs a couple of times. And, you know, it was refreshing, and I'm glad we're on the WWW. It was refreshing to see, I think, the governor of Kentucky to ask the people to pray for the people who were um, affected by this. And Ellisville, um, Illinois, which is right across the river from St. Louis, uh, drove through that place several times. They had a number of deaths uh, in the candle factory. Remember that? You heard about that? So we're going to take time to remember those folks. And then I want to give you time to pray for anybody on this prayer list that you, for whom you wish to pray, okay? All right, so let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we come to you this Sunday morning in Advent, and dear Lord, first of all, we pray for the Palmquist family. We pray for Sherry's family, her husband, and loved ones for Ed as at her, at her passing this, this yesterday. Dear Lord, thank you for the years of life that you gave to her, but also, dear Lord, be with this family through this time of loss, Comfort them and surround them that they may join together uh, to be of benefit and comfort to one another. Lord, in your mercy. Today, dear Lord, we also take time to pray for those individuals on our prayer list. We pray, first of all, for Bill Volkert Sr., and we pray that all is well with him and that he will return home this day. We also pray for Donald Los and his family in Pennsylvania. And we pray, dear Lord, that you would give him the healing that he needs to be able to return home. And now, dear Lord, we take time to privately and individually and personally raise up those people on our, this list or our own list who need our prayers this day. Lord, in your mercy. And finally, dear Father, we do take time to pray for our fellow citizens and the people of Kentucky, Illinois, and other places as they recover in the onslaught of tornadoes. Dear Lord, as we live in this world, we know that nature and mankind don't always get along very well. And dear Lord, today we pray for all those who are recovering and suffering in the aftermath of these storms, especially those who have lost loved ones and those who have lost everything, their homes, their jobs, their places of business and everything, dear Lord, we pray for them. And we pray that 
help will come to help them restore and get their lives back together. Dear Lord, teach us in this country the value of prayer, that your people can pray for one another in this land, knowing that our Heavenly Father answers our prayers. Lord, in your mercy. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to continue with Zechariah's song. This is something we use only during the season of Advent. Remember Zechariah, whose father was he? Oh, Johnny the, the baptizer. And uh, comes from Luke chapter 1, I believe, or 2. Would you please stand as we... No, before... Yes, I'm sorry. I'm having a senior moment. So be seated. We're going to continue with the song, the hymn. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee. All right? And then we're going to stand for the third verse. And then we'll continue with the Benedictus. All right, Brian? Okay? All right, let's sing the three verses of Joyful, joyful, we adore thee. the Benedictus, okay? Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. As he spoke through the mouth of his holy prophets who have been since the world began. That we should be saved from our enemies from the hand of all who hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers, and to remember his holy covenant. The oath he swore to our father Abraham, to grant us deliverance from the hand of our enemies, and that we might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness all the days of our lives. And a new child will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins, through the tender mercies of our God, when the day will dawn upon us from on high. You will give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. 
Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. And we pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Printed out for you is the benediction. It is a paraphrase on the verses from the sermon. Would you join me, please? Rejoice in the Lord at all times. Once again, I will say it. Rejoice. Next, let your magnanimity be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in every situation, make your requests known to God by prayer and petition with thanksgiving. As a result, God's peace, which excels all human planning, will stand guard over your hearts and feelings in Christ Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Just uno momento. So let me uh, share a few announcements. Go ahead and have a seat. We're, let me share a couple of announcements. First of all, Wednesday uh, devotional is at 11 o'clock. And for those of you who have been there, yes, we will have a meal this week. And uh, I'm not telling you what, but it will be something we have not had for quite a long time here on this property. <laughs> so anyway, 11 o'clock, and, uh, and uh, it was nice to have a meal together last Wednesday, wasn't it? Those of you who were here, that was nice to have that. We, we need more of that. Also, next Sunday, we have a guest preacher, uh, Pastor Park. Uh, he is Korean, but he is planning to start a seminary in Taiwan uh, for missionary work in China. So I want to invite you to come. He will preach in both services. Between services, he will give a presentation on situations in that part of the world, okay? So I invite you to come for that. Should, should, be, should be wonderful. I guess that's it, all right? So we're going to close with two songs. The first is The Joy of the Lord by Twyla Paris. We haven't sung her songs in a while, have we? And then we're going to close with Go in Peace, My Friend, and that's where, you know, we do that in a round. Okay, so let's... Sing the first song first.
So, go in peace, my friend. We haven't sung this since the beginning of this year. So we're going to sing it together a couple of times, just so you get used to it. Then we're going to do it in the round. And who's going to join me on this side? Beth, why don't you join me? And you guys can, and you guys can start, and we'll be, we'll be the echo, OK? But let's sing it together first, all right? Let this be our benediction to each other. job on that one. Jesus bless you. Have a good week. And are we going to hear it again? Sure. <laughs> Have a good week, everybody.